Uganda Matters University Council and Senate with pleasure invite parents and students to the 26th virtual graduation ceremony which will be held on Friday 21st of May at the main campus in Nkosi under the theme like the Uganda Matters the Lord will stand by me and give me strength the graduation ceremony will be aired live on BBS TV starting at 9 a.m. and on all university social media platforms the guest of honor will be Mr. Gideon Badagawa the executive director Private Sector Foundation Uganda. For more information, visit the university website on www.umu.ac.ug or call 0382 410 or 0772-461-386 and 0782-924-509. Uganda Matters University, making a difference. Christopher Mukidi, then we add the anthems, and after the anthems, I will continue introducing, and then we go into our commencement lecture. Get ready, members, to enjoy this enriching experience. Thank you. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. God, our Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the gift of each one of us. We ask you to bless the keynote speaker for this commencement lecture, and all of us, especially the graduates, that we may all open up our hearts to receive the wonderful ideas that we shall receive from this lecture and that we shall not just listen but implement what we have learned. We make this prayer through Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Mukidi. We can uh, proceed with the anthems, and we begin with the Uganda National Anthem. Then, Come on, come on. Come on, come on. Come on, come 
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, online and here in the Uganda Matters University main boardroom. I understand that members can understand where we are now. So for those who are already in the main boardroom, I request you to take your seats. And those are on live stream, YouTube, and those on Zoom, and Facebook, we welcome you all. Well, we are very glad to have you as we celebrate the academic experience of Uganda Matters University. And as said in the beginning, we are going to enjoy this enriching academic experience. And without wasting any time, I would like to call the Vice Chancellor of Uganda Matters University, Reverend Professor. John Chrysostom Maviri to give us a welcome remark. Thank you, Professor. Our guest speaker, I'm very honored to meet you for the first time, but I've read a lot about you, and I'm sure you are the right choice at this time to have an input, not only to those who are waiting to graduate, the graduates, but also to all the youth in Uganda, because this is being broadcast wide, and uh, I hope that other people are sharing this. So, Mr. Chaz Ochidi, you are most welcome to Uganda Matters University. And I thank you for your promptness and the dedication, because today I would also like to say Aid Mubarak to the Muslim community. And, uh, you know, it is supposed to be a public holiday. But I think we are celebrating this public holiday with a sharing of knowledge that is going to transform us uh, the day after. Um, members who are attending to this commencement lecture, our graduates especially, and the investor community and the stakeholders, I greet you this morning and welcome you to this commencement lecture, which is the ninth one, but celebrating our 26th graduation part two. Part one was done in December last year, and this is part two. I'd like to thank the organizers who have worked very hard under very uh, difficult conditions to have this graduation. As you may know that uh, many institutions are really struggling to do business in this time. It is a very challenging time of the COVID-19 pandemic. The resources are scarce, the jobs have been cut, the salaries have been trimmed, and there's a lot of suffering in regard to sustaining the economy, but also household incomes. So those who are going to graduate next week on the 21st of this month here at Uganda Matters University must know the environment in which they are going to set themselves. And this lecture is going to help us to be realistic and be creative so that we can 
contextualize ourselves properly in this time of the COVID-19. This virus seems to be uh, on the rampage, it's not yet over, and we do not know when it will end. So what we plan now will have an impact on the future. And it, it will be uh, wishful thinking that this situation will go away completely, even if the virus will be put under control. So I think this is also a golden opportunity for us to think and to, 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 to be creative and to adapt to new situations using the knowledge that we have acquired. So I'd very much welcome our speaker to give us this uh, knowledge. He has been very much, he will be introduced in details, but what I know, he has been very much concerned with enterprises in Uganda, in East Africa, in Africa, and is, he has international experience, and I'm sure is the right person to take us through this commencement lecture. With those words, I would like to wish everyone uh, a good listening. You can put your questions, and I hope that it will be very, very fruitful. Thank you very much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Professor, for those very wonderful words welcoming us to the ninth commencement lecture. I would like to uh, refresh uh, this, even though you already have uh, the theme, but I would like to read it again for all of us to understand wherever we are. The theme of this ninth commencement lecture is what will post-COVID-19 employment employability mean for Ugandan youth, opportunities and challenges for Ugandan graduates. And for that, with that, I would like to introduce in details, maybe in summary or in details, our wonderful Mr. Charles Erabu Ochichi is our speaker today. He holds an MBA and an MS in Investment Analysis from UK. He has over 20 years of micro, small and medium enterprise development in Uganda and the rest of Africa. A widely respected and notable speaker in international conferences organized by the UN the World Bank and the British Council. Acknowledged authority on private sector issues in Africa as featured in CNN, BBS, BBC and leading local media houses. Founding Executive Director of Enterprise Uganda the country's premier enterprise and the Business Management Institute. 2009 award winner under the annual British Most Influential Alumni Contest. First president of Enterprise Africa, a 14-member umbrella body of enterprise development institutions in Africa holds board directorship in banking, education, and NGO sectors. Currently, board member of Makerere University Holdings of St. Mary's College, Kisubi. In 2009, he was declared one of the 60th Ugandan national heroes by readers of the new vision. With that enriching, encouraging, and great experience, let us put our hands together to welcome our notable speaker, 
Mr. H. O. Charles Erabu Ochichi, your most welcome twin reachers. The Vice Chancellor, the University Senior Management Team, the rest of the staff of the university, students, and graduates, dear listeners and viewers. I'm extremely delighted to have been invited to come to Uganda Matters University. A university that today has had impact, influence, and respect across the country of Uganda. I come in here with a lot of excitement and also a lot of delight because I feel opportunity like this is not always available. I have been introduced, and my background is empowerment of an ordinary person to make financially independent using the resources that you have and where you are. The subject I'm addressing today in this commencement lecture has been clearly highlighted. What will post-COVID-19 employability mean for the Ugandan young people? The opportunities and the challenges, especially for those who have gone through a university education, including those that we are graduating next week at Uganda Matters University. Let me start by just highlighting things that we already know about COVID-19. In terms of effect in our generation, in our lifetime, nothing like this has ever been experienced. Experienced in ways that had never been envisioned. And since we're talking about employability, I'll just pick a few statistics just to illustrate what's happening elsewhere so that you begin to appreciate that if it's happening in those locations, what could it be in our African context? What could it be in the Ugandan environment? We are all familiar of a respected British I mean, Brit, uh, airline called British Airways. It is flying across the globe. Because of COVID-19, it has released 29,000 employees, trained pilots, trained crew. We have also heard of a very respected pharmacy, a chain in the UK called Boots. It has also laid it's a staff that it educated, nurtured, and developed 36,000 within 12 months. We have a leading aeroplane manufacturer, Airbus. In the last 12 months, after recruiting, developing great team, it led 6,000 go into the market. And I bring the statistics just to tell us that the situation is damning. Even those with high qualifications, excellent experience, opportunity to have been developed elsewhere are being told, unfortunately, the market does not permit us to hold you. If you leave those sectors that I've mentioned aside, let's look at the banking industry. There's a leading bank called HSBC. It also has had to lay off. 60,000 employees across the globe. We have a leading entrepreneur from the United Kingdom, Richard Branson. And this is one individual that has had an interesting, illustrious career in the private sector, in the rails, in hotels, in aviation. But as he continued to grow across the globe, 
during the last 12 months, Virgin Atlantic has had to close its subsidiary in Australia. This would have been the man for us to look at and say, how will this one cope? And we look at him to try and borrow a leaf. But he's now saying, it's too much. I have to retreat to my base in the UK. Australian subsidiary, let's close it. You leave the entities that I've just mentioned, and then we look at the governments. How are the governments responding? We have heard about Joe Biden's stimulus package. $2.8 trillion. The U.S. is saying, we want this money to go out. And they're putting this money not to the rest of the world, concentrating in their domestic challenges to revive their economy, to get jobs for their own very people. You look at Europe, the same is happening. All I'm saying here is employers of repute are releasing experienced, energetic employees at a time when we are graduating our young, young people and sending them to the market. We're also saying countries that we used to depend on are now saying, hold on a bit. We will not continue to be over generous. We are first going to concentrate in the domestic territory. If a country then like ours has been having reliance on this kind of economies, and the economists are now saying, please, we have a lot in our backyard. We will look at others but later and cautiously. And I think for those of us who value the Bible, it goes to First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. Look after your own, especially the very own members of your family first. And that is now exhibited by the way COVID is pushing economies to first concentrate in their own domestic challenges. Coming to Uganda, our own country, a country that has been depending to a great extent, over 50% of our budget, is funded by these economies that are now saying, we're closing our passes for now to first concentrate on, on our very own. What's the picture in Uganda? I call it chaotic. Chaotic because even before COVID-19, jobs were scarce. We would release people to the market, to even get a young person to have opportunity to be interviewed would be an honor. Very, very tough, even before COVID-19. As COVID-19 continues to strike, the traditional sources of jobs are now downsizing. The Standard Chartered Bank has left major cities like Gulu, like Mbarara, and said we shall concentrate only in Kampala. That's a big bank and saying, I'm going to use technology. I'm closing myself off from those locations. How do you leave Mbarara? How do you leave Gulu? And you go back to only Kampala. You look at San, San Big Bank, similar actions have been taken. Close those branches. Let the agents take over from there. So indeed, the picture is extremely, extremely worrying. But let's look at another angle to it. Those who get jobs today, when they get those jobs, clearly they are unemployed. Why? You get our young graduates today being employed as fuel pump attendants, tellers in a bank, supermarket attendants, and this has got something that has got bad effect on these young people. You've been stretched with good academic content. And then you go and stand at the fuel pump. All we are looking for is put the pipe in my tank and release for me adequate fuel. And I go. It doesn't require you to think a lot. It doesn't require you to have gone through education that took you through a three-year course at the university. So boredom sets in. Now, the moment this young person is bored, and there's another one who has gone through the same job, he left senior four. He's also doing the same job. The senior four fellow would be more diligent than a university holder doing a similar job. 
should a promotion happen to be there in that fuel pump, it will be more to a senior four person than to a graduate because the attitude is different. Where now a person has been given such a low caliber job. One more thing, those who get these jobs who are few, the salary is corresponding to the nature of the job. There is no way you go to a fuel pump station owner and say, please, I got a degree. Would you give me a salary that reflects a degree? You will simply say, I'm paying a salary that reflects the caliber of the job. Now, that salary, if you look at it and relate it to the kind of investment that will have been done to get this person to go through university, how many years do you need to work at a fuel station, at a supermarket, at a money agent outlet, while paying for your rent, while paying for your feeding, while paying for your transport, and then you save some small money on a monthly basis to try and see how many years do you need to save to recoup 12 million. If you are saving 20,000 per year, I mean per month, that's 240. 240, compare that to your 12 million, easily over 50 years of saving to try and just recoup. This is the picture that we are sending our young, our young fellows into. I want to say that even as a country, as we look at options to try and give our young people hope, I've already pointed out the options for the developing countries are getting fewer and smaller. The generous donor nations are looking inwards. We are now looking at the bigger borrowers like the World Bank. But the World Bank people are saying, we can only lend you so much because we don't want you to overheat with the debts. And Uganda, as we stand today, our debt stock is hitting what we call the ceiling of 50% of GDP. And the moment that happens, what does that mean? What it means, therefore, is sources of resources for economic research station from donor partners diminishing. Prospects for borrowing from international agencies like the World Bank, the ADB, African Development Bank, extremely getting tight. What then is the future for a young and energetic graduate? And I emphasize those two words, young, energetic. He is just beginning to have his hope and his journey. What's the future? But before we look at that future, I want to just summarize what I call the standard template for a fulfilling career, or a fulfilling lifestyle of an adult. I call them the life constants. There are three things that every adult will always aspire to get and enjoy as they live in this planet. One of them is good health. And obviously the young people are endowed with this one. They have vibrancy. They have got all it takes to be able to, to move and enjoy their lives in terms of health. But obviously, the moment idleness is there, this could easily be attacked. Because idleness can take somebody to reckless lifestyle. The second thing that we need for us to enjoy our, our lives as adults is constructive networks. Because networks will always be your lifeline whenever there are challenges, your lifeline whenever you are looking at opportunities. And for the young people, the current networks, they have their own colleagues. We call it are stranded, family, friends, who may not be able to completely look after their needs. Their club associates, where, when they were in the university, these are the kind of networks that the young people have got. And I want to say this, that um, young people as you leave the university and young people as you stay in the university, cultivate this as much as you can right now. I, as a person, have enjoyed the privilege of having had an education that exposed me to very interesting talent and a talent that I started to meet right from my college day, days at St. Mary's College, Kisubi. At my current time, I almost have a, a colleague somewhere in a high position in every organization that I can mention. You mention MTN, you mention Standing, you mention Ministries. My colleagues are at the upper level of leadership. Now, if you did not 
cultivate good relationships during your university days with such individuals, you lost out on a fundamental aspect of life that you can rely on to sort out issues that you have. The other aspect, of course, for any adult to enjoy one's life is financial freedom or financial independence. But I want to say this, that it has been noted that permanent wealth takes three generations of entire growth. In other words, if you're a young man today and you have reached that level of permanent financial independence, you should be the third generation, meaning your father and also another father who made wealth and passed to your father and your father expanded that wealth and that wealth is being passed to you now as the third person expanding that wealth. Unfortunately, in this country, and especially for most graduates, the limited resources that were available in the family were largely invested in your education. And people are now saying, you are our investment. We have nothing else we are looking at. We sold the land, we took loans, we sold livestock to get you through school. You are our investment. And because you are our investment, we say at last finally he has graduated. When do we start to get the reaping? Now, you are being looked at as the first generator of the first generation of wealth. The other generations completely lost everything and then they said the last bit of their resources, they invested in you. You are the family redeemer. You are the one they are looking at to change their fortunes. What a picture. As you come into the market, the family is saying everything is dry and you yourself, you know what daddy and mommy has done. But the message is you are coming into a world which is saying opportunities are low. They are diminished. They are gone. In my view then, what should be the outlook for a young person in this kind of a circumstance? I want to say that the number one thing that a young person today has is their health, their energy, and their attitude. Their attitude. An attitude is really a fundamental aspect of life. Indeed, attitude is viewed as everything. A leading entrepreneur, philanthropist, and inspirational leader in the UK by the name of Oprah Winfrey put it plainly. She said, the greatest discovery of all times is that a person can change one's future by merely changing the attitude. And she used the word merely, meaning it is within your reach to change your attitude. And that is the lock, that is the key that you need to direct where you are going to. Under this cloud we are in now, under the expectations from the family that has invested in a young person, how do you then ride on the power of attitude? But before we go to that, what is attitude? What is mindset? We turn in our organization called Enterprise Uganda to define this in a very simple way. Attitude is the way you look at two things. One, yourself. If you look at yourself as somebody who has come from a poor family, no hope, and you have come from an environment where you think you have no connections, you will not be connected to a job, you've sealed yourself. The way you look at yourself is fundamental. The second aspect of attitude is the way you look at where you are, your environment, what you have, what's going on around you. If you think that Uganda is a dead country and you just want to run somewhere, you will be concentrating on doing nothing but getting a passport to run abroad and go and do anything outside, hoping that that's where it will be sorted out. But at the same time as you are doing that, somebody from Asia is busy selling anything they have to come and do business in Uganda, and within 12 months, they are headed towards half a million dollars. For you, you left the same environment, you went to mid Middle East, sacrifice all your energy and all your health, you come back with hardly $5,000. Another person has left another continent and has come back to your backyard. No connections, 
no knowledge of the area, no knowledge of the local market, but he has made half a million dollars within 24 months. What a contradiction. So attitude is so fundamental, and it's also fundamental because according to God, he says we are the summation of our thoughts and our beliefs. That person from Eastern, from, from, from the Asian continent came here, saw what we didn't see, and transformed it into a massive wealth. We left our own country, went to another destination, even where they tell you that, please, when you reach there, we'll remove the passport from you. We'll remove the telephone from you. You still go. Leaving an environment behind where somebody has come in and is saying, I have come to this environment where communication is tough. And these are people who have never gone through primary school. They reach here. They come and deliver opportunity for themselves to make amazing wealth. When I say that our God has said we're a summation of our thoughts and beliefs, you must be saying, where is it, Mr. Gigi, exactly recorded? And yes, it is recorded on, in Proverbs chapter 23, verse 7. Very short, very concise, very complete. It says, as man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Wherever you are, whatever you have done, whatever the circumstances where you are, the thinking and the way the heart is believing, it is sums where you are headed to. It is sums where you are headed to. And God is not saying this verse is only valid the moment you have got connections. It's only valid when you are outside Africa. It is simply saying, are you thinking? Are you believing what you are thinking? That is who you become. And to me, it is good news to know that the thinking and the believing that God has allowed us to do is within our control. It's good news. Our future is indeed in our own hands. And if so, how should then a graduate approach the job market? If thinking and believing is such a powerful tool. As you think about employment, as you think about jobs, I want you to first forget a few things. And some of the things I want you to forget are do not wait for a formal interview. Do not wait for a formal appointment. Turn up yourself and go to a place where there's opportunity to do something and start doing that something without necessarily being asked formally to apply. Formally to write some, 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 some interview and start delivering a solution. What am I saying here? At the university, we teach you economics, we teach you accounts, we teach you auditing. In this country, circles are falling into pieces. And the things that are hitting the circles are just record keeping. Things to do with management, structuring things. Things to do with analyzing what's going on. As a young person, don't wait to be interviewed for a job. Just say, circle owners, I know you have a circle. Can I have a look at your records for three months? Can I see what's going on in your circle? Can I give you a feedback on what's happening in terms of the repayment of the loans? Turn up. Don't wait for the appointment. Do the job. Deliver that report with all your heart. By the time you give that feedback to that circle, they will say, oh, what a young man. We even didn't pay him. But listen to what he has said. He says, we are not recording all the receipts. He says, some of the money that was supposed to be paid is not being recorded in the account of the company. You are already beginning to have authority. By the time you do that one act, there's another circle in the neighborhood. It has problems. As they are fixing this circle, and they are beginning to a difference. Remember the mission of Uganda Matters University is provide quality education for the betterment of society using ethical values. As you make this society better, and they start saying, this young man came, he looked at our records. We started implementing them. He looked at the way we were recruiting. He guided us. He looked at the way we were marketing our services. He guided us. That is a referral that begins to go around. The next circle will be saying, give us the name of the young man. They call you there. 
This time, instead of giving you just opportunity to assist them, they just say, how much can we pay you? At that point, the money has started looking for you. You were initially the one dying to get money, but you took the first step of saying, I'm not looking for interviews. I'm not looking for appointments. I'm looking to be of value to somebody somewhere. I want to be of value somewhere. Wake up in the morning with that desire. The moment that second circle says, we want you, we, we have heard what you've done in circle A. Can you come and help us? But we have only 200,000 shillings. Receive the 200,000. But again, go and deliver value beyond the payment. In other words, the focus should never be on the size or regularity of the check. But adding value and making a difference, as our university says, making a difference. The moment you make a difference, you stand out. You knock the right button. People will start saying, there is even no appointment for this young man, but we want him. We want him. The next time they will be saying, can we give you a job? Our salary, we can afford this. And they are trying to remove somebody who was careless and useless in the environment where they, they even interviewed that person and they found the person was not having the same difference that you are beginning to make. So don't bother about the rank, about the size or the consistency of initial paychecks. And when you do this kind of delivering yourself to the market and desiring to make a difference, start with people who believe in you. There is a big temptation from young people and anybody looking for a job to always be looking for a formal name somewhere. I want some company with some registration somewhere. Start where you are. You are a veterinary person. You are seeing somebody who is planting and the way he's planting and spacing the crop is going to make losses. Take time and talk to that person. These are people who know you. These are people who can give you opportunity to make a difference in their lives. Look at the markets around Uganda where people are selling bananas, selling whatever. In those big markets, Nakawa, everywhere, the records are issues. The losses they are making are immense. Beginning with such people, where you are, where you are not even saying, please, I'm looking for a formal job. You are simply saying, I want to make a difference in what you are doing. Can I start giving you records on what you are doing in terms of your restaurant? And then the person will start saying, oh my God, I didn't know that. When I sell beef, the profit per plate is only 2,000. When I sell beans, the profit per plate is two and a half thousand. I better increase the beans where there are more people eating the beans than thinking that people are looking for meat. How did you reach that decision? Records. Where did the records come from? A young man you had not even given an appointment. So, do not mind about the employer being formal or informal. Do not mind about the quality of their physical address. What you are looking for right here is a track record. A record that will make people say, Who, where has that young man made a difference? And human beings are concerned about being the first buyers of a particular solution or a service. The moment you say, no, 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 you are not the first to try and employ me. I've already been assisting people in Nakawa market. Do you know the woman in such and such a place? Go and ask her, she will tell you what I've done to her. Go and ask so and so, he's looking like the best in that market, but I made him to do much better. Track record. And this calls for you to take 100% responsibility therefore for your future. And for you to do that, you need to avoid what I call the three C's of a nasty mindset. Three C's. C number one is Always complaining. Assisted so and so. They did not even give me anything. Assist the person. If they have not given you anything, go and check whether you made a difference in their lives. If you made a difference, that is sufficient. If they can just confirm that, yes, their difference came because of your intervention. Don't mind about the non-payment. The third C of a nasty mindset is criticizing everything. When you complain, you complain about anything and then criticizing every human being that you interact with. It was my father who told me to take this course. I would not have taken this kind of a course. I wanted the other course. That is the, the past.
cast. Another sin is condemning. You condemn yourself as for us the youth, nobody wants us. Nobody is bothered about the youth. The youth have been abandoned. The youth in this country are rejected by the bank. They have condemned the whole generation of human beings. And these three C's are associated with the word which God says is a fundamental trait of a human being. Gratitude. The moment you have these three C's, gratitude gets out of the window. And lack of gratitude tends to diminish your ability to desire to make a difference in others. So, in order for you to do the things that I'm mentioning here, you also need to manage and one more thing that I thought is important for young people. Choosing friends that you interact and talk with on a daily basis carefully. Who are the three people that you talk with regularly? Ask yourself in our conversation, are we on the three C's or are we on gratitude for something? If each conversation is here, you know they mistreated me like this. You know they refused to do this. You know, instead of saying, yes, I had a chance to talk to somebody with the restaurant. And believe me, he didn't know he was losing money on milk. He was so happy. And I'm going to talk to him again today about the way they are purchasing sugar. You look for the silver lining in every situation. And if the friends that you have have that kind of speech, you have a reinforcing opportunity from fellow human beings. Because as human beings, we associate with somebody else. And that association will either diminish our optimism or it will reinforce it. The other thing that I would share for people who are lacking jobs and you really need to begin to get your foot on the ground is mastering life skills. A list is here, but you could add leadership. A life skill of leadership simply says leaders are not given titles. They just turn up and begin organizing things. They know something that's not going right. They begin to comment and get influence around the area. Second life skill is communication, ability to be clear, clear and communicate. Because you have done something good in a particular area, talk. Don't just imagine somebody who might talk about it. Fine, if they talk well and good, but can you also talk, communicate, articulate? What have you done? And as you do that, do that with a desire to do the same to another life somewhere. Communicate. The other one is time management. Friends, in an environment like Africa, where people will say, I am on the way. But he's another 30 minutes away. I'm about to arrive. Yes, I was in Barara City. And I was like waiting for somebody just around the roundabout there as you enter the city. Somebody says, I am in the, the, the market which is being renovated now. I'm on the border. I said, now that's very near. It took another 18 minutes to loop that short distance on a border to reach where I was, this was a lie. Time management is one small thing where you quickly make an impact on any society. You give a promise to somebody that I will be at your farm at this point, get there at a time, and let them be the ones to come and apologize. For you have already been there. And don't do that only at the beginning. Let it be your trait. Let it be part of you. Don't even sing about it. People should be the ones to sing about it. Yeah, for you, just do it. The other trait is teamwork. Because society is full of people of enem enmity, jealousy, and nastiness. Anybody who will make another human being do better because of your existence, you have space in this world. And young people, you need to start this as early as possible. Of course, the other one is salesmanship, ability to sell and say, I am who I am, but this is what I've done. I may be young, but this is my track record. Sell it. Convey it. The other one, of course, is part of our own vision. The mission says work ethics. You need to do whatever you are doing with a lot of integrity, with a good character. The other one is negotiations. The world is a world of cruelty. cruelty. Whoever manages to take the deal and has, means has taken it and taken it fully. 
So ability to negotiate for yourself. Ability to negotiate for your customer is a very key trait that you need in this life of post-university. And Africans have been noted to be very poor negotiators because you cannot be a great negotiator when you are poor at getting enough information and synthesizing that information to be able to communicate and talk with the person on the opposite side of the table. All the things that I've mentioned are things that I call the door openers for you to have opportunity to become employable, no matter the nature of the environment. Why do I say this? Even where people have got employees already right now, they're having issues with those employees. Their attitude, their lack of team spirit, they are poor ability to apply themselves well. The moment you turn up and you are bringing these things, people start saying, oh, by the way, let's just keep him as a part-timer. He looks good. All that the employer is saying is, I'm looking for value. I'm not looking for titles or longevity of employment of somebody. Who can come in my environment and get employed? Now, the moment you have used the informal routes that I've just mentioned to get your track record, to get recognized, May I say this, invariably, an MTN, a bank, a big company will see your attitude and will invite you and say, can you come for an interview? I've got interviews next week. This time it is the employer calling you to apply. You've been the one throwing applications everywhere. They have been ignoring your applications. But because you started your track record on your own, on the informal path, the other fellows are saying, we love your attitude. And we love it because we have already people inside here. They don't have the attitude that you have. Can you make an application? You will cross from somebody who started a track record on your own, and you will be employed. And employed at a better salary. Now, should you get that employment? Here are some five things I caution you to embrace immediately. Because you might say, since now I have entered a formal environment, I discard self drive. Never do it. Let self drive remain your identity, your nature, and the way you lead your life. How do you exhibit self drive? Five things. Number one, average employees that you'll get in that organization will always be talking about job protection. I'm here to protect my job. Anybody talking about protecting a job is losing it. The best thing to protect is not the job, but the career. You are an auditor. Be the best auditor you can ever be in that place. People who are protecting a job are almost nasty to the extent that they don't want another good person as good as them to get nearer them. But if you are protecting a career, you are not bothered who else is doing what you are doing. You just want to grow and get better and better. And people who protect careers are people then who come up with what we call people of a calling. Once you have a calling, it's now beyond money. creativity gives you space to 
become a super employee. And I say super because the moment you are in this kind of a space, you are spoiled for opportunity. In a world where there are no opportunities. In three months, you'll get two approaches from somebody saying, we want you. But you are happy where you are and you are saying, no, no, I'm happy where I am. Number three, an average employee will respect authority. But respecting authority in such a way that they want to just please the person as opposed to pleasing the customer. The person you call your supervisor, or fine, you can respect him. But the most important thing is not so much making your supervisor happy. A super employee outlives supervision. You now supervise yourself by saying, what does the customer want? I know my boss is happy if I report at 8. But the customer wanted this assignment earlier. Why don't I, why don't I report at 7 a.m.? You are now outliving supervision. The moment you are all the time saying, where is the boss so that I do this? Where is the boss so that I do this? Where is the boss so I do this? You are the average employee. You will be given a job, but should there be opportunity for really good jobs? It's not you. We go for the other person who says, I know the boss wants me to do this, but I'm going to come earlier. Why? The customer is my ultimate authority. And the moment you have that in your mind, you are preparing yourself for a true world of adults. Number four, an average employee meets agreed targets or goals. The super will say, the goals and the targets you have given me are the average goals for anybody in this position. I'm not anybody. I'm I'm superior. So I'm going to cover the targets you've given and I'll add another 20%. But without being boastful about it. If we see this attitude, friends, you may be young. You could be 28. You will supervise people of 40 years in a very short time. Because these are the things that transform entities, that transform businesses. Finally, the average staff believes in what I call the status quo. What is the status quo? There is only one financial controller in this organization. Because of that, however much I work hard, the current financial controller is still young. He's likely to live another 15 years. So why bother to work so hard when there's already an occupant of the space? Let me tell you this. The super will never look at that status quo. They will say, the only determinant of how far we can create new positions is the customer. If we become so big and we need to open a subsidiary in Rwanda, we will now need a financial controller in Rwanda. Create the customer's flow and the positions will be adjusted. Create the business volumes and we'll give you as many titles as you people want. But if you get yourself dampened because you are saying, there's only one deputy in this organization. Where else can I rise to? You limit yourself for no good reason. So I wanted to leave that part of going for a job for a young person. The first point was disobey the traditional rules and begin to have a track record. The second point is with that track record, whether you want to or not, you'll be interviewed by somebody at the initiation of the employer, and you'll get a good job. But should you get a good job, let self-drive be your identity. The second half of my submission is, even when you get a job, you need to become an entrepreneur. Where are you putting the salary that you're earning? Every 30 days, do you eat it? Nobody comes to check in your account to check where is the balance of last month's salary. Nobody does it. You have been given money and a, the human resource manager is simply saying, we pay you every 30 days. It is your private affairs. What you do with it, it's up to you. But let me just tell you this. Today, we have gotten a new cabinet coming into place in Uganda. Check the outgoing cabinet members. After one, month, one, one, one year, how many will be able to still pay the school fees of their children? 
and I'm talking of one year. One year. They got salary for 60 months. The salary was in excess of 25 million. Before they went to parliament, they were earning maybe 600,000. They go to 25 million. They get out of parliament. They are struggling. What am I saying here? There is no way you create wealth on the basis of riding on a salary for which you have no control when it will stop. Wealth is created from a buying happy customer. Now, assuming now for you as a young person, you've not even gotten opportunity to work. So, Chichi, the salary really is not there. May I still say this? It doesn't really matter. The root of entrepreneurship is open to every human being in the world. In fact, the very first creation of God was created as an entrepreneur. When Adam was created, he was not shown a bank to go and get money from. He was not shown anywhere to do anything. God simply said, here is a forest. Here is the entire world. Go, fill it with babies. I will not give you medicine. I will not give you a shelter. I will not give you accommodation. I will not give you fire. Sort it yourself. Secondly, dominate it. But as you dominate it and you want a spear, I've hidden a mineral called iron one kilometer down in the soil. And I'm not even going to tell you that this is how to get it out. Sort yourself. We were created conquerors, entrepreneurs, people who walk in there to deliver solutions. Now, you don't need to have cash of any volume to start an enterprise. So, what does it take, therefore, for you to go into business as a young man who has been rejected and not been given a chance to earn even a small salary? Before I give you those three or four things you need to do, I'm going to give you a very short story of Enterprise Uganda's young person who has made what we call a legendary story of what it means to go into business and make money, and make money big. This young man called, is called Yasin Magino. He came from Buyende. He used to get his money for paying school, school fees by engaging in um, loading fish for somebody who used to get fish from Buyende and bring to Kampala. So he did that until he reached Makerere. In his second year, he had about Enterprise Uganda and said, I want to go and attend that training. He attended our training. After the training, he went back to Makerere University and he was now left with just a year to go to finish. During that one year, he had what we told him. That no matter who you are, no matter where you are, you can start from where you are. And within four years, you'll be hitting a billion shillings. Oh, yes, in Africa here. And I mentioned to you that people are leaving Asia to come to Uganda to hit a billion in less than four years. I'm measuring four years for the sake of it. People leave Asia to come to Uganda and hit a billion with nothing. Now, this young man decides to go back and told the person who used to employ him, told him that, you know what, sir, you have been employing me. I've just attended the training where they have told me that with whatever money I have, I can succeed in business. Can I send this money to you so that you can buy the fish, sell it on my behalf, and then you send me back the money plus profit? The boss told him, this young man, either you go to Buyende and I give you one offer, a space in a lorry where you buy your fish for one box and put the fish there. But have you about the fish? Can you follow that lorry to Natete and sell the fish yourself and take your profit as you go back to the university? It was a hard message. But he got it right. On Friday, boarded the taxi, went to Buyende. Started to buy the fish, loaded them on a truck. Saturday morning, the truck is heading to Kampala. He's also heading to Kampala. On Sunday, he's selling the fish. Sunday evening, is back to the university. After 12 months of the third year, one, he did very well at the university. He got an upper second. But two, the 500,000 he started with had reached 5 million. In 12 months. After that, what did the young man do? And where is the story today? Because I don't have much time. Today, this young man, Magno, has got the following. He exports fish, 3,500 kilos per day to Kenya, per day. He, ex 
He sells fish in Natete and in Boise, 3,500 kilos per day. It is now five years. He has built three houses in Jinja. He has established 12 mobile money kiosks in Busoga towns and in Kampala. He has three lorries, all of them refrigerated for transporting his fish. The third lorry, it was the banks that begged him and said, young man who are seeing your account, the way this account is flowing, can we lend you money? You know what people say? Bankers do not want to lend money to the youth. Who should lend money to somebody with no track record? Why? We are making the young person commit suicide. So, the young man has a track record. The bankers are saying, we want you. Finally, he said, okay, you finance the third lorry. He has three lorries. It is so... It is tempting not to announce these figures, but let me just say it, because I'm addressing young people out there. If you go and look at the calendar of Enterprise Uganda on the page of December, you see the story of the young man there. But we never put the final figure, which is the big figure. This young man makes a sales of 357 million per month. Per month. And he says his profit is between 15 and 16 percent. That is no less than 60 million net per month. Per month. The young man is 29 years. The young man was born to a single mom of seven children. The mom was a laborer in other people's gardens in a small district called Buyende. What am I saying? Uganda is a country of opportunity, but you need the right attitude to start going the route that this young man did. When he started doing this, he would always go back to the university when he's smelling fish, and they called him Mr. Fish. They were calling him Mr. Fish as he's back. Mr. Fish is back. He said up to today, he proudly accepts that knowledge, I mean that, that, that title. He is a mega, 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 mega dealer in fish. He has now left Buyeda and he's also Nakasongala and other landing sites. And I bring this story because if you watch this young man, another two, three, four years down the line, so far he has now bought three plots of land in Namgongo. And he says he wants one build accommodation flats. He's aiming at 40 units in the next four years. 29 years. Add another four years, he will be 33. He's operating in an environment where we are running away from. In an environment where we are saying there are no opportunities. In an environment where we are saying the youth have been rejected. Until you just change the attitude you have a totally different opportunity ahead of yourself. So friends, listen to the story of Magino. What are the learnings you can get from here? One of them is that true entrepreneurs defies common wisdom, such as what? You don't need a sophisticated business idea. Look at anybody from Asia who has come to Uganda to start a business. They start from the basic solution. Mukwano is a classic. They were in Gomba. The father of the late Kamali Mukwano was in Ikomba, in a village. From there, they went to Jinja. From Jinja, they went to Port Cotton and started doing trade in coffee cotton. Then they went to Kampala and started a shop in Loom Street. Then they started a factory. Today, the biggest shopping areas, shops, the biggest malls are owned by Mukwano. The biggest offices owned by Mukwano. But beyond that, the chairs, the pens, the cooking oil, everything that you almost need for your life is coming from the Mukwano group. Where did it come from? Basic business idea in a village. Don't get yourself overwhelmed because your idea is not sophisticated. Entrepreneurship also is not about a sophisticated business plan. It's not about special amount of startup capital. It's not about a special business location or education. It's not even about being in a group. Sometimes you say, form a group. No. Buyers do not ask before they buy something. That, are you a group? You just go and buy chicken. Full stop. Whether you are two or you are one, I want chicken. 
It's not about waiting for approval from anyone. The game changer here is start as soon as possible. But as you do the starting, let me quickly now cover the few things you need to do. The starting point is develop a good business idea. How does that, how does that one look like? It should solve a problem. It should meet and fulfill the need. It should offer better customer service or simplify life. That's a good business idea. And the idea should be one that you can start where you are, the way you are. Don't say, I have three million, but I wanted to start a border border and I lack another two million. What is it you can do with three million? Go on with that one. The moment you tell this brain that, you know, keep looking for the two million, you can do nothing. The brain will go in to searching for things to confirm your inaction. But yeah, you can't take off. Even so and so, you have to add more money. In fact, the two you are looking for is not even enough. But the moment you tell your brain, in the meantime, what can I do with the three million? You wake up in the morning and the brain will be telling you, can you go and see what the neighbor is doing? How did he start? Start with what you can get in terms of capital, in terms of skills, in terms of time. And each, as you start this basic enterprise, you need to boost your interest, your inspiration, by looking at the contribution you are making to improve humanity. Remember our mission there, it says, provide betterment of society. To what extent is what you are doing, that looks basic, improving the welfare of society. Never mind what people will say. So that's the idea. But as you do that idea, I want to also say that um, I remember saying that you don't need a sophisticated business plan. Where is research in this game? I have what I call practical research engagement. I call it assess the key success factors of the type of business you want to get into. How do you get to know those things you must do well to belong in a particular type of a business? Those are the things you must get right. If you are going to chicken, you must make sure that there will be no sickness. If you are going to chicken, you want us to make sure that the eggs do not rot. If you are going to chicken, you want to make sure that the chicks do not die because of the common chick diseases. What are the key success factors for any type of business that you want? Now, to know those, you must first recognize that whatever you intend to do, somebody already has done it. So your role is to go and understand those who have been there. So, talk to existing owners of a similar business. Talk to a key staff of an owner of a similar business. Because somebody is called a key staff because he's good. And sometimes the key staff is more knowledgeable than the owner of the enterprise. Take the fellow for lunch. In one of the cases that we had here, the person who was selling cassava and Tesla was having problems and wanted to understand somebody who was already doing it well. He couldn't get the opportunity to talk to the owner, but he managed to get the driver. The driver said, it is me who transports the cassava to Sia every week. I know how we lost money in the beginning. If you are going to go into cassava, then he gave him all the nitty gritty of what it means to go to Busia and sell cassava. If you get blinded by the title driver, you miss out an opportunity you can't believe. By talking to this driver, this man got all the key success factors of what it meant to deliver cassava to Busia. Because there was a day in the week where this Paul turned up. If you don't know that today, you'll go there and go away saying, ah, there's nobody who buys cassava in this area. There was a day. There was a way cassava must be cut in pieces. If you go with certain pieces, they say, no, oh, that one. Would. Then you say, no, they don't buy cassava here. It is the type of cutting. Who knew that? This driver knew because they made all those errors and the driver was seeing. So talk to a key staff of an existing similar business. Talk to suppliers to existing owners in the sector of interest. Because those suppliers are supplying your competitors. And to them, 
Those are not their computers. Those are their customers. So they know why this fellow here, this university is doing better and the other one is struggling because when the supplier is bringing his things, he says, you know what, for us here at Uganda Matters University, we need to include fish because we have managed to attract students from this and this and this location. And we do that by doing the following. The Baza is talking to the supplier of fish to the university. Now the fellow who is supplying the fish is listening that information and is about to supply another school. You see, do you know how the Adami University managed to get good students? This is what they did. Conversation of your supplier with the Baza of your competitor will lead you to vital information which even your business plan will not be able to capture. So you do those basics, you are entering what we call the inner sanctum of key success factors in your business. The other way of getting the key success factors is talk to a subject or a sector expert. This is key. Without knowledge of the key success factors, you can jump and say, oh, Chichi said you can get a billion in four years. I'm going to start chicken business. You'll get in there without doing what I've just mentioned, the chicken will move from three to maybe a thousand, and in one week, disease will attack and everything will go. The message will still be valid, except you missed to do what I'm saying here. Obviously, the moment you have now gotten the key success factors, there's now what we call consolidation business mindset, which means you need to remain on edge. On edge means do not get too casual or too general. Keep your records. Remember the story of the good shepherd? He counted the sheep in the morning as he was releasing the sheep. He took the sheep to the grass, to the waters, and he never saw any animal chasing the, 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 the sheep. He never saw any blood anywhere. But as he was reaching the gate to push the sheep back in, he again counted them. He said, the moment one is missing, if you have done the counting, immediately take a decision. Why? The one that has gone missing today is not the end of the stealing of your sheep. If they have tested your sheep yesterday and you did nothing, the next day they are removing two, then another three, then another four. The story of the shepherd simply says, remain on edge. Don't be casual. Count, count, count diligently. There may be no signs at all of stealing, but count. And don't be too believing, too trusting. Don't rely solely on blood relatives, shared religious beliefs, tribe, past contribution of an employee, because people do change over time for various reasons. And never be too forgiving or too lenient. Any employee who crosses the line, send the message across. Some of you have heard about a company called Yuga Chick. It collects 100,000 eggs every day. But every day, they check employees at the gate for one egg. They are saying, you don't leave our gate without us checking in case you have taken one egg. But they collect 100,000 every day. And when they catch you with an egg, they will not say, we found somebody with an egg. They say, we found a thief. The recorded statement is, we caught a thief. The volume, the number does not matter. The description matters. The description matters. And in, at the end of it all, you need to continue setting a goal, accomplishing it, set another higher one, accomplish it without stopping. And I conclude with that one by saying, this is not just about me talking about this. If you read the story of the the talents. There were three people who were given resources. One was given five. The Bible in Matthew chapter 25 says, immediately he traded and the five became ten. And the master said, thank you. Well done. Come and celebrate with me. You are faithful with a little. I'll give you more. The same statement was given to somebody who was given two and made them to become four. Then there was somebody who was given one. And he left one to become one, but even rusted because he buried it in the ground. The master said, I will not tell you thank you, I will abuse you. He said, you are wicked and worthless. And he did not say, 
come and celebrate with me. He said, I will kick you out to the darkness where there is wailing and shedding of tears. And finally he said, I will not give you more. I will remove even the little you have. What am I saying here about business? Business does not, or wealth does not accept to remain the same size. If you are going to start the journey to wealth, you have earned a salary. Did that salary grow in your hands? Or did you ate it all? You made sales. The money came through. Did you eat it all and give an explanation that you pay school fees? Are you the first to pay school fees? Are you the first to have a relative who fell sick? There are no excuses of any kind. That is story of the good shepherd, I mean of the talent, simply said, whatever you have in your hands, learn to multiply it. And multiply it non-stop. In effect, as I conclude, I have a short saying here, which I thought the young people and anybody listening to this commencement submission should appreciate. It goes like this, that uh, life is 10%. What happens to you? What has happened to you? You got a degree. That's 10%. How you use that degree is the, the other 90%. What has happened to you? You have gotten a degree at the time when jobs are few and scarce. That's 10%. 90% is how you are going to respond to that situation. You have come from a family where you have exhausted all the resources. That's the 10%. How you respond to that situation is the 90%. The message I'm driving home is the past should never limit what is big ahead of you. So for the young people, ride on your good health, ride on your good youth, ride on the opportunity in a country where people come to with nothing and they become rich and rich on international terms. How do you describe $500,000 and somebody in the UK does not respect you? But you get that in a country within less than three years? That's a country of opportunity. I want to thank again the university administration for giving me a chance to talk to the young people and give them a message of reality in our country. The cloud looks big, but the silver lining is very bright. And we need to capture the opportunity. I thank you so much. Thank you. I would like to thank our speaker during this uh, commencement lecture. And I think the hand clap was not enough. How about? doing it again in a more a better way. Thank you very, very much. We are very grateful. Our graduates out there, uh, the academics and everyone there, I request the speaker to take his seat. Thank you very much. Our academic staff members, administrative staff, the graduates, the management, and everyone out there, please, you can start sending your questions on the chat, and we shall give opportunity to people to speak. If they would like to speak, we would give that opportunity. So right now, after that enriching and great inspiration we have gotten from our speaker today. We are going to hear from Professor Simeon Wanyama. But what I need you to remember is do not undermine any opportunity there. It might make you great. That is what I have picked from the speech of our speaker, Mr. Charles Erabu Ochichi. And right now we are going to hear from Professor Wanyama. Professor Wanyama is a professor of business administration and management at Uganda Matters University with a strong 
learning towards corporate governance and accounting. His teaching career traces as early as 1970s in the seminary secondary schools in Uganda and universities around the world. While his governance, administration, and management roles dot all his schools and adult life, Professor Wanyama has been in the service of Uganda Matters University since various capacities, in various capacities since 2001. To date, that makes 18 years. And he has served in various capacities nationally and internationally, with the highest being acting vice chancellor. He has an MBA in accounting at St. John University in New York and PhD in accounting from the University of Dundee in Scotland. He is on board of committee, he was and he is from that time and I'm reading different boards. German Joint Healthcare and Investment Company, Joint Medical Stores, German Adult Committee of the National Curriculum Development Center, 2012-2015 Chairman of Finance Commission, Archdiocese of Tororo, 2011-2019 Chairman Board of Public Procurement and Disposal of Public Assets Authority, and Chair of the Complaints Review Committee of the Board. In 2007 and to 2018, Member of Council of Institute of Certified Public Accountants of Uganda, Chair of the Education Committee, and Member of the Public Accountants Examination Board. In 2008 to 2011, past Chairman of Uganda Business and Technical Examination Board. In 1999 to 2001, Chairman of the Advisory Committee for Centenary Rural Development Bank, Mbare Branch, Uganda. And in 1986, Chairperson of the Staff Development Committee, Uganda Catholic Medical Bureau. He has worked in different Catholic dioceses as being a priest. I think with that enriching experience, he is the right person, our very own, to discuss this uh, in, during this very commencement lecture. Reverend Professor Wanyama, we welcome you right now here. Thank you, sister, for your kind introduction. Our guest speaker, Mr. Charles Ochichi, I'd like to start by thanking you for your very inspiring presentation. You have lived to your reputation of being a motivational speaker, and I appreciate what you have presented. Vice Chancellor, members of management, members of the academic staff, our graduates out there, the various people who are tuned in, I feel privileged to be here to discuss the presentation made by Mr. Ochichi. I will start by highlighting some of the points that he covered, and then I'll try to build on those points and add a few more points. He has stressed the loss of employment all over the world, and he gave the details. The aspect of technology, which is taking over a number of functions, which were being done by human beings, even like now, commencement lecture, 
could be in person, face to face, that we are using technology. The need for constructive networks, whether it's colleagues, friends, family, and others, financial independence, change of attitudes and mindset. I think he made quite a number of good ideas about that, the attitudes that we have that will affect whatever we do. And he said, what you repeatedly do shapes your attitude or character and the skills, competency levels. How you do any job charts your future. And wherever you are and whatever you do, seek to be of value. Don't bother about the size or consistency of initial pay. Start with the people who believe in you. Do not mind about the quality of the employer's physical address. Your friends and the people you surround yourself with make a difference. Master life skills, and he mentioned several of them. Meeting agreed goals. To succeed in business, there are two laws which he put in his presentation, which he wrote, the law of entry and the law of sustainability. He gave us examples of successful people, this person from Buyende whom we talked about, and develop a good business idea or a concept, I think it was a very good point too, where you can solve problems and says you can start where you are with what you have. Learn from those with experience in the field and keep sharpening the key success factors through a learning culture. Do not be too believing or too trusting. Set and fulfill goals. And I think in his written presentation, he had recommended organic growth as much as possible. And also learn to save and to reinvest your profits instead of just consuming what you receive. Those are just some of the point, <clears throat> some of the points I picked out, but there are many other points which you might have picked up. The topic is what will post-COVID-19 employability mean for Ugandan youth, opportunities and challenges for Ugandan graduates. <clears throat> so I start by looking at employability. What is employability? And for me, there are two aspects of employability. One is seeking employment as an employee. You are hired by somebody else. And the other one is becoming self-employed. And I think entrepreneurship was highlighted by Mr. Chichi, and that's one of his uh, main um, calling or present role in enterprise Uganda. So I will look at these two aspects of seeking employment as an employee and becoming self-employed. Seeking employment, I've been <laughs> teasing some of our students who are completing that when you leave Omo, you are going for another course or another training. <laughs> And that is streetology, <laughs> where you are walking on the streets <laughs> looking for jobs, streetology. <laughs> and it, can, it is not easy. Maybe some of the shoes you have bought will be worn out and will be knocking from office to office. But you are there seeking employment. And um, sometimes Mr. Chich talked about the, the law of entry. That is where the law of entry comes in. How are you going to enter an organization? I think it's a very major point. If you want to get a job straight away, which is in a prestigious company and very high paying, you might continue working for some time before you get the job. So that is where sometimes starting as a volunteer in an organization can be very helpful. People get to know you and maybe offer you a position when it is available. Another avenue is through internships. You apply for internship where you work without being paid a salary. Maybe you are given some allowance to 
cover your transport and other small things like meals and so on, but you get an entrance. You have must plan for an entrance strategy. How do you get there? Once you get in, it will be easier for you to get full-time employment. Some of us might be privileged that we have friends, relatives, or we come from families and other well-connected people who will help us to get jobs. If that is there, fine. That is entry. Doesn't necessarily mean that you'll sustain the job, but it's also another means of entry. Now, I think if you want a job, identifying job opportunities is very important. Where do you get these job opportunities? You might be reading newspapers, looking for adverts, or perhaps looking at websites of various organizations and companies, and some of them post opportunities which are available. I know you are aiders and a number of other organizations who also has been posting jobs on the website and a number of other institutions. So trying to identify or even friends telling you about such and such an opportunity and you try to apply there. And uh, when you apply, of course, you hope you will get the jobs. You may or may not do so. You can also look for jobs, as I said, for yourself, responding to adverts, proactively seeking jobs by moving to various places, and even depositing your CV and the transcript in various organizations. I know some of our students have been doing so in the banks and other institutions, but be proactive and go out looking for jobs in various institutions. Marketing yourself through content and quality of CV. The first thing that people get to know about you is through your CV and your application, and also the academic transcripts that you attach. So this must be done very professionally. If you present a CV which is full of mistakes, they will not bother about you. Some people are very conscious about grades, and I remember having arguments when I was in PPDA as the chairman of the board about the minimum requirements. Why they were saying one must have an upper second or a first class degree to be considered. But I don't think the best performers in organizations are not are necessarily those with the first class or a second class degrees, upper second. But that is the requirement and most organizations will require that. And we, as when we are here as students, sometimes we don't care about that. We go through university not caring about our academic grades, yet they might give us a, a chance to enter certain organizations. However, the CV is very important. Let someone check your CV and make sure that it's presented in a professional manner. You know what job is being advertised or you are looking for and you tailor your CV to that advert or job so that the people, they can see that you have the, what is required for that position and you can be considered. The personal grooming or appearance is also very important. <laughs> when you go for an interview, you appear and you are looking, I don't know, like you what, and the, the hair may be painted red or yellow or whatever, <laughs> bright colors. <laughs> the dressing also, the way you are dressed. I think that personal grooming is very, very important. I've been on some interview board panels where someone walks in the door, walks inside, but as soon as the person opens the door to enter, some people make up their minds whether they will take that person or not. Just by appearance. So appearance is a very important aspect also when we are looking for jobs. And uh, also when you, I think it was here also, where we had an applicant who came in and he sat and the, the appointments committee was sitting and so this, the chairperson was the, it was the bishop. Someone sat down, he came in and sat down without being invited to sit down. And he said, let me first pray for you. <laughs> so 
that you make, listen to my presentation and so on. And even some, I remember we had another one who was a former student of Umu, who came and was being asked questions, I think it was in accounting, and was giving an answer which was not correct. And he kept insisting, this is the answer, this is the answer. If you don't know something, say, I don't know, but I'm ready to learn <laughs> something. I think be humble, be polite. The way you present yourself is very important. Even when you come in, the fold that how you are carrying your papers is very important. If you have a, pro, a folder with the papers neatly packed or arranged, and you can present that, rather than coming with the papers all over, and <laughs> I think you are picking up papers, this one, looking at, don't know like what. So the presentation is very, very important. And we are, we are, I remember I was on another panel and a candidate came in and sat down, a man, and <laughs> sat spreading his legs wide and then he started fanning <laughs> in front of an, an interview panel. We had a lady member of the panel who said she felt like just sending him out. Please, the way you present yourself is very, very important. And um, so avoid, also some people, particularly ladies, make this mistake. You hear there is a job opportunity somewhere. You tell your friend and you go with your friend to apply for that job and you are sitting together applying for the one job. Now, whom will they give that job to? <laughs> So you disadvantage yourselves that way. There's something, present yourself and argue your case. So self-confidence is very important when you are having these interviews or looking for jobs. When you are asked a question, answer it. Try, if you know something, answer confidently. If you don't, there's, there's no problem admitting that you don't know. People will say, <laughs> I remember when I was being interviewed to join Umo in 2001, that is 20 years ago, not 18. Um, one of the questions I was asked, what is your strongest quality? And I said, my strongest quality is that I know that I don't know everything. <laughs> but I'm willing to learn <laughs> whatever needs to be learned. That surprised them. <laughs> but that, uh, that aspect of trying to learn being ready to learn and picking up whatever is required is very important. Being confident without being overbearing or without insisting on things which are not true. And acknowledge if you have any shortcomings, acknowledge them. And some people are asked, what is your weakest point? And they say, I don't have any weak points. <laughs> I don't know what human beings these ones are who don't have human weak points. So being organized and being polite is important and personal mannerisms. The law of entry, uh, for me, the other point was, so this was um, seeking employment. Now for job sustainability, you have been appointed there. How do you sustain your job? So the law of entry is just one aspect. But when you are there, I think you also need to continue marketing yourself. Show that you are knowledgeable, that you have the skills which are required, the competences, you are willing to learn new things if there are areas which are identified where you are not quite competent and ready to take up, readiness to take up entry level positions and salary. If you go to an organization you have just graduated, be ready to take up as Mr. Chiki said, <laughs> salary should not be the issue. But the idea is you want to get in and your concern should be how do you get this into this company or organization. Once you are there and people see what you are able to do, then the rest will follow. If they appreciate what you are doing, maybe your positions might be changed or your salary arrangements and so on. But in any case, in my view, one of the most important aspects of getting employment after university is to gain experience. Once you have gained that experience, you can apply for any job. 
So you can take that as your objective when you first get a job. How, how much experience to get? I'm told that, <laughs> I was told there was a certain interview. Most of these adverts would require a minimum result of three years or three years experience. And you have just graduated. So one, one former student was so frustrated being asked the same question about experience. So he asked the panel, can you tell me of any university that teaches experience? <laughs> I can get the two years experience <laughs> before I apply for any job. <laughs> and he had presented his case, eventually he was taken. But that can be very frustrating, being asked for experience. So if you can gain that experience in any position that you are offered, I think you are increasing your chances of growing in your career. The question of appearance, of punctuality, of mannerisms, I think I, I'm very important. And then, so sustaining employment, I think, makes yourself someone who adds value to the organization. I think these days we talk a lot about value addition. Why should we employ you? What value will you add to our organization? So that is something that you should show, that when you are in an organization, you are adding value to that organization in various ways, what you do, uh, show commitment and loyalty to the organization, be willing to go an extra mile in the service of the organization, even if someone is not part of it, something is not part of your profile. Some people will say, I was not like, you have an office, you are working in an office, there is no cleaner who is employed. Say, I can't clean, <laughs> that is not part of my job profile. I think there are a number of other things you might be asked to do various things. Please make yourself someone who is valuable in the organization and do whatever you can to add value to that organization. Go the extra mile in the service of the organization in that way. Be pleasant and respectful to your bosses. I think Mr. Chich mentioned about this being respectful. It's not just yes, yes, yes. But the way you talk, you can also come up with contributions or suggestions. And not, I think some people make a mistake when they are in organizations. They find their boss maybe is not very knowledgeable in a certain area. Then they won't show that they are more knowledgeable. So they start telling the boss, no, you are wrong here. Yeah. <laughs> know how to present your suggestions in a respectful manner to sell your points so that they can be agreed upon, accepted. And the same applies to workmates or teammates. Be respectful to everybody. Don't appear as if you are, a, I don't know, a superhuman being or more knowledgeable, more experienced. But you don't have to say that. I think people will see that by what you do, by your output. Contribute to the discussions and suggestions on how to improve the organizations. Sometimes you have meetings and suggestions are invited. If you just keep quiet and keep quiet, and you wonder why your friends are being promoted and you are not being promoted, <laughs> I think you have yourself to blame. Come up with useful contributions, but presented in a respectful manner. Being efficient and eff effective, I think, is another thing that one needs to consider being efficient in what you do, being effective. I remember I was, <laughs> I, was doing, I was working with a certain organization in New York City when I was there. And when I went there, as an, I was employed as an accountant. So I started clearing my desk very quickly each time and so finishing work. And my friends were not happy, the colleagues I was working with, they were telling me, slow down, you'll make us look bad. So, so, but being efficient and effective, I think, is very important. Take initiative and don't wait to be told to do things which need to be done and keep your boss updated. There are things you see maybe you are in an office. A simple example, maybe paper is finished. Will you just keep quiet until someone notices it? Or can you bring it the attention of whoever is concerned? Start doing things 
taking the initiative in various things. Timekeeping was stressed by Mr. Chichin, and I still stress it, and willingness to work. Don't say, ah, I'm too tired, I can't do that, or I can't do this. Try and offer the best input and, and also add value, whatever you are doing. Timekeeping and willingness beyond the official closing time when need arises. There are certain situations which need you to work longer hours. When you are there, you don't say, ah, it's now five, so I've ended my work, I go. But there's something which is pending, which needs to be done. Or tomorrow, like for accounting profession, it might be a Saturday or say, I can't work on Saturday. And yet you have that deadlines to meet. So try to see how much you can contribute. Find value-adding networks or connections for your organization. You should be on the lookout and say, what is, what is required? What opportunities are out there? And bring them to the attention of, of whoever is concerned. Always consult if not sure of something. There are some people who will just keep quiet and or pretend to know something and yet they don't know it. They end up making mistakes. Consult if you are not sure. Give feedback to your supervisors. I think these feedbacks are very important. If you have been assigned to something, give a report of what you have done. Or if there's something that you had to do, but maybe the superior supervisor had not told you, also give that feedback so that they are in the know of what is happening. So that is as far as employ employability is concerned um, when you are employed by somebody else. Of course, there are a number of other points which were mentioned by Mr. Chichi and others which I have not mentioned. The next part I would like to uh, discuss self-employment. So self-employment is Mr. Chichi's area <laughs> of entrepreneurship, I think. You yeah, are the guru in that. Um, the spirit of entrepreneurship, I say, is a sine qua non. It's something that you cannot do without, like the key success factors. You must have a spirit of entrepreneurship in whatever you do. Even in employment, you need to do that. Whether self-employment or employment for somebody else. You need to identify a problem or a need which is not being fulfilled. I think that's the starting point. What are the opportunities there? What problems are there that are not being fulfilled? That is the starting. You don't just say, I want to do this and you do it. You don't know whether <laughs> there is demand for it or not. See if there is demand, if there is a need which is not being fulfilled. Find ways of addressing the gap or solving the problem to meet unfulfilled needs. You have identified there is a gap, there is a need, how do you address that need or gap? Then get mentors who have done similar things if available. Like the example you gave us, someone who was dealing with fish and got mentorship from somebody else. But there are various ways. If, some, if you want to start something, try to get in contact with the people who have been doing that before. And what can you learn from them? So that mentorship is very important. Don't just say, I have initiative, uh, this is to be done, this is not being done, therefore I do it. You might end up burning your fingers and so losing your investment. Surround yourself with a good, knowledgeable, or with a good, knowledgeable, reliable, and trustworthy team. That will help to promote your business. Getting a good, knowledgeable, reliable and trustworthy team that will help you to promote your business is important. The selection of the people we work with can either enable us to have success or fail. They can start cheating us or misleading us or not even having the competences that are required. So you need to identify the right people to be able to do something. Offer better customer service, definitely. If someone else is doing something, why should you do it unless you do something better? Whether producing better products or offering better service or offering this in an, an innovative manner that will make your products or services more desirable 
than of the competitors. Mr. Chiki said you can start where you are, the way you are. It's very important. How much do I have? And even if it's very small capital, you can start it small and go on growing. I think that's important. I've been telling my students sometimes that when I was in the parish, I'd gone to an outstation and they gave me a chicken. And I was looking forward to enjoying that chicken for supper. But one of the catechists said, no, let me go and keep it for you. So I gave it to him. After some time, he came and told me the chicken had produced or hatched chicks, and now he had got a goat for me. After some time, he said, the goat produced, I've got a cow for you. <laughs> Within three years, I had five cows from that chicken. And even people who have maybe started planting trees, someone plants a tree now and continues growing the forest and eventually reaps big. Or even coffee, starting with a few coffee plants and so on. So whatever you can, whatever little capital you have, what can I do with this capital? Which will help me grow the capital and become big and so on. So start where you are with what you have is a very important message which we are told by the, the guest speaker. So within your reach in terms of capital, skills, time, and so on. So what is within your reach? But as you invest, maybe I should add, invest in areas where proper management is assured. Sometimes we start things and we fail because of the management. If we are not, uh, if we are not sure of, pro of the management, Maybe we should look elsewhere, but make sure that you get proper management for whatever you start and know what is required to be able to manage that project. So um, the contribution you are making to improve your situation and that of humanity should motivate you. So what you are doing, why are you doing it? What do you get from that? What is the motivation? You want perhaps to start your financials to build your financial uh, security, or that improve the well-being of a community. This is some, sometimes I tell students that you should start preparing or planning for your retirement when you are students. I say, what do you mean? We are very young and so on. <laughs> but if you can start now, start small, and go on improve building on that, by the time you retire, you'll have something to retire on. So it is never too early to start planning for retirement or start planning for your financial security for the future. And establish and make, recently I was having a, some thought, I've started growing coffee at home and we have got quite a field and so on. So I was saying, you use a tractor to clear the place or do you employ human beings to do the work? Or do you use chemicals, herbicides to kill the grass? Or do you use people to weed the, <laughs> the crops and so on? These are real decisions to make. A tract, of course, will be much faster, and they say cheaper eventually. But what is your objective? For me, one of my, the objectives I have is to see how the community can be improved. If you create employment for the community, you are also contributing to the development of that community. So you can have different considerations, financial, non-financial, and so on, when you are making a contribution. So establish and maintain value-adding networks, like suppliers, customers, clients, funding agencies, government agencies and programs, where can you get value and maintain, identify the networks and maintain those networks and work with them to be able to strengthen. Like Mr. Chich was telling us, a bank coming to someone to offer a loan to buy another, a third lorry. When a number of these agencies identify someone who is doing something well, they will be able to come to you. You can work with them and they can build you up also, as long as you are accountable and offer 
regular reports and showed that the money is being used profitably. So what are some of the challenges? Because challenges was one of the points in the topic. Because one of the challenges was limited employment opportunities and scaling down of staff due to COVID-19 or just downsizing for efficiency and economy. So it is not just a matter of getting rid of employees, but also having a smaller staff, which is which will use um, maybe technology and other sources. And a number of them, like for accounting firms, these days, a number of them don't want to, to hire full-time staff. They will outsource. When there's a job, they will find someone to do it. We have also a limitation of uh, starting capital. We might not have enough starting capital. I don't know what Mr. Chichi's view would be, but a number of people have recommended that when you are starting business, don't use borrowed capital to start business. Yeah. Try to avoid that. Because you might borrow, the business might collapse, and you are not able to pay back the debt. So start using whatever resources that you have that will not put a strain on you or on the business. And use organic growth using a sort of process which are invest. Once you have established a regular cash flow, then you can borrow because you are sure that you'll be able to pay back the loan that you have got. Getting qualified, experienced, competent, and trustworthy staff and partners have mentioned that before. Sometimes it is not so easy to get qualified, experienced, competent, particularly the trustworthy staff and partners. Even people you trust, your brothers, your sisters, your friends might let you down very badly. They use that project as a source of getting funds for themselves instead of growing the business. Finding sources of supplies and adequate market for your products can also be a challenge. Be sure of the market before you start. <laughs> that is always my recommendation. If you want to do something, is there a market for what you want to produce? If you are not sure of the market, you might produce and nobody will buy what you are producing. So what is the market for what you want to do? Um, finding good employers who will help you to develop your talents and not exploit you. Sometimes that is a problem when you are looking for, for employment. You might end up with an employer who is not interested also in your personal development, but is just interested in exploiting you. So that is something also to look at. What are the opportunities for development where you, where you are being employed? And when we are employers, how are we helping our staff to develop? So entry-level salary, may not be adequate to meet your needs. Most, most often it is not, particularly if you are a volunteer or a, an internship. So you have to make a choice between gaining experience and getting adequate remuneration. So what do you want when you are getting this job? Is it to gain experience to give you better opportunities in the future, or do you just want employment to get as much money as possible? So job experience might be the key that you need to get a better paying job, so we should not overlook it. These are just some of the points that I wanted to share with you. And um, if you need any clarification or want to make further contribution, you are most welcome. Thank you very much. would like once again, once again to thank uh, Professor Simeon Wanyama for that great discussion and I request you to thank him by a very big applause.
thank you very much, Professor Onyama, for that discussion of the presentation of our guest speaker. And right now, we are actually running out of time, especially those people online. Would like to give opportunity for those people online who'd like to ask some questions to our guest speaker. All, um, and then we, we can also read some few comments uh, or questions, and then we'll give the opportunity to our speaker or uh, the discussant to explain. We have a question by Claire, which says, uh, this is addressed to our guest speaker. What is the best way of finding opportunities in our respective fields? Since we don't know many people in their areas, I'm going to give it to you so that uh, you, you can answer the questions. And by Henry, mastering life skills is vital, but by human nature, you cannot be perfect in all life skills mentioned. I would like to know if there is a life skill which may outweigh others. <laughs> which life skills should an employee not miss at any single moment? By Claire, I hope that is another Claire. It is advisable for one to continue studying so that the job finds one there. Sorry. Is it advisable for one to continue studying so that the job finds one there? And by modest, how can my colleagues and I who need training in entrepreneurship access the training by Mr. Ochichi? Thank you very much. We are going to give the, best, uh, the guest speaker time to answer these questions. Thank you very much. What is the best way of getting opportunities in our fields of training or education? Open the door. The moment you are out of the university, get out of the door. If you are trained in motor mechanics, I'm just giving an example. Go to a garage. And one starts seeing people doing garage work. While you are there, Try to seek an opportunity to start participating. I say do not seek to be invited. Do not seek for interviews. Initiative is the key thing here. If it is a medical field, it's the same. If it's accounting, the same. Please, please, the market is looking for solutions. How can you deliver a solution to someone? And almost every field you have been educated in in this country, the needs are so many, but we are being limited by the fact that as you go for that opportunity or solve that opportunity, you expect to get immediate payment. Just go with a desire to make a difference in somebody's life. That's what really I want to emphasize. If you are seeing somebody dealing in chicken, go to them and just start saying, I am trained in poultry management. Can I have a conversation with your production manager? Initiative, initiative again. Never be held back by the fact that you have no connections. Be the first to create that path and get yourself out there, courage. And some of you have been in the university, if there's one word where God repeated himself four times in one chapter, the word is courage. And at that time was giving a job to Joshua. Joshua was taking over from Moses. He told Joshua, be of courage. I'm sending you out there to take over this job, and I'm the appointing authority. They are going to doubt you. 
So do not mind what the society will say. He told him, be of courage. Chapter 1, verse 7, courage. Chapter 1, verse 7, courage. Chapter 1, verse 18, courage. At the closing part of that chapter, he again told him courage. So young man, young lady, nobody will take you to prison for having tried. Nobody will embarrass you or do whatever that will make you completely permanently valueless because you tried. I encourage the word courage. Somebody is talking about life skills and he says, the list is long. Can I manage all of them? You don't need to be bothered about the long list. Start somewhere and all of them are practical. Life skills are practical things. Leading, you start leading from where you are, right at home. Keeping time, you start keeping time from where you are in anything that you are doing. Teamwork, you start from where you are as you interact with individuals. Life skills are skills that you apply almost on a daily basis. So trying to say, for this week, I'm going to be practicing teamwork, and I don't want to practice time management. You're waking up, and there's time in front of you. Why, why don't you practice that one as well? And I think the only thing that you want to do is to recognize the fact that perfection is to God, but aspiration to excellence is to humanity. Try as much as you can to improve your excellence in this long list. Because as a human being, you are imperfect, but you can continue to improve. You need salesmanship. Every day as you wake up and sell yourself, and the selling we are talking about here is not pitching where you go to some television house or some media platform, and then you are making this grand submission. It's being able to just sell to the market vendor in Nakawa, in Bugolobi market, that you're able to do the following. We have practiced that thing today. Communication. No human being doesn't communicate. So when you look at life skills, there's something about them. They apply to your life instantly, right now. So serializing them and saying, oh, this week I'm concentrating on communication. Oh, this week I'm con concentrating on work ethics. You mean yesterday you could ignore work ethics because we have not yet started going there? I want you to start somewhere with each of these. And if possible, put them on a, on, 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 on a place where you always see them. You, you can call them now your life values so that you start seeing them. Organizations will have values, but in terms of now human being, this should be your life values. So do not get overwhelmed with life skills. They just make you a normal, a welcomed human being in society. Can I continue studying so that the job gets me when I'm now doing my PhD? I finish a PhD, I go and add another master's, I finish a master's, I try ACCA, I finish ACCA, I go back and go for law, I finish law, and, and someone should get me there. Friends, don't even before you finish the course that you currently have. Yes, student of accounting. As you do those figures that you are doing there on an income statement, you know somebody within your circles, the family, the uncles, where you can begin to practice the accounting I mean, principle of an income statement. Start applying these principles. Never postpone a knowledge or a skill that is being given to you by a university because you have not yet finished the three years. There are things you got on day one. They are applicable that very day. What we have done is to hold on to our skills and imagine that, you know, until I've been given a certificate, I cannot yet start talking about income statement. You did income statement in the first year, start applying it. At the school that you, that took you to school, Go to that school and just say, I want to produce an income statement for the school. I want to produce a budget for the school. Be practical. Be practical. Never imagine study knowledge that you get from a university must be housed. And then you begin to practice it only when you have stepped out of the university with a paper saying, now you have a profession uh, in auditing. Somebody wants training in entrepreneurship, and I do appreciate that um, 
it is something that we really need to take seriously as a country. And I made a statement that no matter whether you're a salary earner, and no matter the size of your salary, that salary one time must end. And when that salary ends, life must move on. And life must move on with a certain lifestyle that you'll have established. So you must begin to have the skills of creating a solution on your own. So Enterprise Uganda can be reached, and I can give my telephone number right now, 0772 699 Give me a call. I will be able to uh, get you to see the kind of products that we offer in this country. It has been a little slow, but we are now beginning to pick up. But get in touch. We have now trained 124,000 Ugandans in business. Some of them now are world-class award winners. Not just in Uganda, world-class. Last year, we had our candidate becoming one of the top three in the UN contest in October, awarded for a great job. Before that, we had a woman who was, who was running a school called Victoria Schools. We are nominated that to compete. She was number two in terms of the quality of the inspiration her story was giving. So we do make people to grow from whichever level that you are in to a sophisticated international range. We're available to do that, and we'll be happy to receive young people coming on board. The story of Magno is not exceptional. There are many others that we have done like this, including the young man that we had to put on a plane to, to, to Geneva, because after he left the camp and went to dug up to some fish ponds. Today he's making 1.4 billion from the fish ponds. But after the training, he dug the fish ponds for eight months. The water came in. He didn't have capital to put the fingerlings. He turned the clay that he had removed out and turned the clay into bricks. The bricks gave him the money to put the fingerlings into the water. So today he digs the fish ponds using excavators. But he started with this little body. And we withstood criticism, name calling. And today he's a respected person with three houses in Gurutau and he has bought 50 acres on his own. Again, 32 years. So indeed, these things can be done, and it's our Uganda, a country with a lot of opportunity. Thank you again. I hope there's another question. If they are not there, then... Oh, from the house here, I would be very happy. Especially what I... I don't know whether I should preempt this, but uh, uh, Professor Vice Chancellor, we have a product that we call dual career. How you can train employees to be able to do two things. One, use your employer as a laboratory to build the skills of self-drive and enterprise. So that no one more time should you be coming in here looking for somebody to inspire you. You should be saying, I'm using UMU as a laboratory to build the skills I'm going to take my own private enterprise. How do you manage the staff? How do you look after customers? How do you handle issues with cost efficiency? You shouldn't be doing those just because you and me wants them. You should be doing them because you have a private enterprise that will require those skills. So that's the first thing that we do, train people in that We teach them how to have a private enterprise when you're a full-time employee. What type of a business must you select? What are the things you must get right as an absentee business owner? Because that's, there has always been that saying, oh, you know, you can never succeed when you're around. This is hard, but it can be done. But I would welcome questions or any submissions from the team in front in the room. We have a question from Anthony Joseph Osele, which says, please advise on the case of one who studies while working now when he or she completes studies and seeks a job along the same field in a different company 
will that experience be considered since it was gained since it was gained before acquiring the degree <laughs> you know what 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 consumers of products are looking for is where have you come from what have you done where you came from if you manage to add value to somebody else where they now know that this is somebody they can start off with so experience with or before you get a degree is as valuable as, valuable as experience when you have already gotten a degree. It's just to say, because I, I gave an example. You did income statement in first year. You can start using that knowledge. It will not be given to you again in the third year. You can start using that experience in first year and start talking about how you manage use income statement to make somebody select the right kind of combination of product lines. So experience before a qualification is awarded is as valuable and as useful as experience that you get post receiving your qualification. I thank you very much. Anyone within the house would like to ask any questions? Yes, we have brother Alogias. Thank you, our guest speaker. My question is, I've heard a statement. Uganda is good at having, we have very enterprising people who are leading in the world in starting enterprises, but it appears they don't last or they don't survive. What advice would you give? Because they have the spirit, maybe they lack something here and there. Yeah, very or good. What is it missing? They have the, the capital which they had, but maybe something else is not there. Very Thank good. you. That question takes me straight to the, the two laws that um, uh, Professor Wanyama again highlighted in my, my presentation. The two laws of going into private sector and remaining there are one. The first one says, sell a solution that meets customer expectations. I want my child to go to nursery, but I want a clean place where my child will learn, where my child will be secure, and I can afford it. The moment you do that, done. I'm not interested to know who is doing it, whether the person is female, whether the person is a youth, whether the person was what. I had expectations, meet them. Now, if you make those expectations the way I want them, I bring my child. And two, after I bring my child, I even recommend you to other people. The next thing is, the next thing is, as people see you run a nursery school for which many people are referring their colleagues to send children to, and the numbers are growing, competition must set in. And the competitor will do what you have done, what made us to come in, clean, learning, security, you are doing all those. But this Paul also saying, beyond that, we tend to know your child by name. We know your child by their challenges. And because of that, I am a little bit better than now you. The computers come in, mastered what you did well, and added more. So the moment you are unable to compete with the next supply of a similar commodity, you must get out of business. What does that mean? You must therefore address the five elements that will keep you in the market and keep you in the market forever. The first one is leadership and governance. Because the moment you lose vision and you begin to think, I'm number one, the vision is gone. You are muddled up in you, the, the, the way you are man, managing that institution. You will be outcompeted. Number two is management of HR. Because your good employees can be taken by the competition. Now, if you're able to keep good employees and the competition can also equal those good employees, what else do you teach your people to become much more efficient than the neighbor? So your HR is very key. Number three is your processes because that's where efficiency and cost effectiveness come in. Number four is your marketing and customer care. That's where your brand gets built in. Number five is your finances. 
Because again, the moment you are bringing resources, no matter how good your solution is, at I've, some I've point, it, you are likely to fail to remain in the market. So it is one thing to sell the first solution, quite another to repeatedly sell it in the open and meet with the competition successfully. And the very things I've mentioned here, they are not only for the young entrepreneurs. The country today is reading an interesting story where one of the leading construction companies in the country started in 1956. It is being removed from a major project in Mbarara. Today it's being removed from a major project in the biggest hospital in the country. Where did it fail? It failed in my view, in managing succession from the founders of 1956 and the next generation that's now running the same brand in the 2000s. If you fail to manage that transition, the big name that you used to make us all line behind you, our expectations are beginning to fall down. And as our expectations are falling down, there are new market players who are saying, we can do exactly what they used to do. Please don't mind, we are going to fulfill them. So two things have come in. We are no longer meeting our expectations in terms of time delivery, in terms of quality. But number two, the competition has since understood you and they have removed some of the employees and taken them. You can't succeed. So in the battle for space, in the battle of success in the private sector, there is no let up. You get in there, it's a permanent war. You only surrender as you are heading to heaven. While still here, permanent war. Permanent war. So business failure is very normal, but the solutions are there, and all those solutions, you really need to address them. You need to address them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Dr. Uma, you can ask your question now. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. I wanted to put it possibly from a different angle, but coming to what you have presented, thank you very much, Mr. Ojit. My concern is on the issue of enabling environment. When you are talking of the issue of the game changer, you are looking at it from the student's point of view. Now, based on my experience as a, I work with the quality assurance office at Uganda Matters University. So, I was looking at it from a different angle. They say, okay. where is our play experience with working with people? What do you think could be the missing link between the university education and the youth employment in Uganda. And what would you give as an advice specifically for Uganda Matters University? Very good question indeed. Here is my response immediately. Whichever courses that we are handling in the university, at Uganda Matters University, and indeed any other university in this country, those courses are meant to give solutions to Ugandans. I would prefer to see a university getting case studies to illustrate every subject that they are undertaking as they teach. And I will pick up one of those again. If we are talking about corporate governance or family enterprises, I want you to be saying, did you see an article last year where a leading company in electrical sector, who are number one dealer in electricals in this country, that company was number one for no less than 10 years. The company collapsed. The owner is still around. The sector has grown 10 times. The a lecturer on a subject related to that should be able to say, I have this. This is what we have picked as public information. But it was this and this and this and this and that. Did you see what we talked about when we we're talking about governance and leadership? Did you see what we talked about here when we talked about a strategic plan with the clear objectives? Did we see what yeah, when it talk, we were talking about things to do with continued market dominance? So in other words, a university should begin to get case studies from Uganda. 
to infuse in the content that we run and give to our students. If it's procurement, there are procurement issues that we are going through on a daily basis in this country. If it's accounting records, there are issues. Why should a leading entrepreneur who has done so well, starting from downtown in Chukubo and goes to Buganda Road and buys a premium plot there, manages to build warehouses, manages to build 30 apartments, but then ends up in a bank and picks a loan that cannot be paid. If you picked that loan application and you checked the cash flow, it was obvious the cash flow was telling you that that loan will not be paid. And the assumptions behind the cash flow were not picking the real situation the way it was. Pick a case study like that. You may say, oh no, it is difficult to get this information. It can be got. And many times, sometimes it even comes from the owner of the enterprise that has had issues. We are the number one steel rolling company in this country, producing the best nails, producing the best Mabati. It collapsed, the owner is still alive. We have since gotten many other big investors in that sector. Is that featuring in some of our lectures? We need to be seeing some of this coming in. We are now seeing a big story of a major leading construction <laughs> company. To, to that was the definition yeah. of construction in Uganda. Because the name itself was a beautiful name. And then the owners were international fellows. Now it's struggling. Nakumat was here. It was the best, probably the most respected brand in East Africa. It has closed. But as it closes, we are getting Carrefour from, from France. We are getting other supermarkets coming from South Africa to occupy the same spaces where Nakumat used to be in. Are we putting this in our case studies for our students to learn? Or simply say, no, 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 this is a cash flow. Give me what the cash flow is. This is a cash flow I got from a textbook written in Canada. Let's adapt these case studies and use them to make the students know that whatever they are doing here, it is practical. And the moment we begin doing that, you know what? Immediately the students will start practicing this message at home in the course of their education. They will never wait for a moment when they have finished school to start applying these concepts. Case studies, local case studies, local case studies. We have a case where Uganda privatized all the, 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 the hotels. And you check all the new people who took over the new hotels, I mean those government hotels, almost every one of them couldn't run that public hotel. But privatization, privatization was saying, you know, government is a poor businessman. The best person to run these kind of things is a private person. Other than a situation where we got some foreign investors, like in a Serena, all the others, the locals couldn't run them. Case study for teaching. So truly, that's a very good question. And I think universities can make it work and it can be a very exciting way for uh, giving our lectures to the young people. Thank you very much. We have another question from Lady Christine. It says, please advise young employees who want to drive big cars, build mansions and many other things in one year. It's criminal. That's what the first statement I say is criminal. First of all, even if they want to drive those big cars and beautiful houses, and they are getting those resources from relatives, which is genuine, they have not stolen. It's a wrong perspective to draw life. The foundations are shallow. The best for anybody who wants good things is to recognize, recognize that good lifestyle is sustained from profits coming from an enterprise where you have fullest control of income. Not even from a big salary where you are being employed and you are signing a contract. Let the big salary assist you to build the apartments or to get into a coffee plantation. From the coffee, please enjoy life. It's within your control. So any young man who is imagining that within 12 months they can start enjoying life 
they must pay the price in a reverse way. And life is more bitter when you start from enjoyment to now bitterness. If you know how to eat sugar cane, you don't start from the tasteless part. I mean the, the sweet part and go to the tasteless part. Start from the tasteless part and continue to where it is very sweet. So there is no shortcut to success. You pay the price either now or later. And if you are getting some of these benefits because somebody is handing over the resources to you, that somebody will not be around forever because the person is occupying a particular position. That position will at some point, somebody else will take over. And you will not be able to enjoy what you are currently uh, enjoying. Thank you very much. I'd like to thank our guest speaker and the people online as well as those ones in house. Would like to give a more loud uh, round of applause to our guest speaker to all the people who have participated. Uh, right now, I will request our guest speaker to take his seat. And right now, we are going to hear from our registrar uh, giving the closing remarks. I would like to thank you very much for being patient and listening very carefully and understanding what we have been enriched with. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Estelina Namutevi, the MC of the day, the guest speaker, Mr. Ojichi Irabu Charles, uh, the Vice Chancellor, the members of management who are here, and those who are online, the staff, the graduates, and all the students. I've been asked to give closing remarks and a vote of thanks to the keynote speaker and to the discussant. I would like to join the Vice Chancellor at the beginning of this lecture by thanking Mr. Ochichi for his dedication and commitment. We are all aware that today is a public holiday uh, he could have been at home enjoying the holiday with his family, but no, he decided to be with us uh, today and giving us this lecture. I would like to invite ourselves again to thank him for having given us this time. Of course, he has not just given us time, but also the topic that he has addressed has touched very pertinent issues, especially for our graduates. And I think we have learned a thing or two, both as students and staff, especially in the areas of employability. I would also like to thank the organizers of this lecture, uh, Mr. David Vesobozi and the Commencement Lecture Committee uh, the ICT department and all the people who have helped them, uh, the graduates, uh, the staff who have also found time to attend this commencement lecture. Special thanks, of course, goes to our graduates. It is because of them that we are here. So we thank them for having been patient and persistent uh, to undertake their studies, especially through the COVID times. Uh, we understand in some situations, uh, students were not able to graduate or even able to complete their studies. So for those of Uganda Matters University, we thank you for the hard work and we believe come next week, uh, you will be able to graduate and be able to achieve your dreams. <clears throat> I would like 
to go, I would like to go back to the keynote speaker by saying that we could not have got a better person to address us on the topic of employability for Ugandan youth than Mr. Charles Ojichi, a man of wide experience and enriching exposure. I'm sure our staff and our graduates and all of us have been empowered because knowledge is power. You have made us aware of the enormous opportunities around us, not to mention the challenges of unemployment associated with COVID-19. I know um, I'm racing against time. Please permit me to highlight only three things which were uh, touched on by the keynote speaker and also by the discussant, Professor Simeon Wanyama. And then at the end, I will answer two questions that, come, that have come from the online listeners that specific, uh, specifically touch on house issues within the House of Uganda Matters University. Uh, one of the things that uh, touched me, or which I feel that uh, I need to again highlight, is the idea of attitude, changing attitude. And I think from the topic uh, that he addressed today, somewhere even he wrote that attitude is everything. And I would like to, to agree with him. <clears throat> Sometime back, I, I read from one of the motivational books where the author was describing a person who had a poor attitude about himself. He had low self-esteem. Uh, he was not confident. And he was always walking from his room, going to work. But because he had those ideas in himself, the, the whole environment around him was so negative. Everywhere he passed, people would recognize that this person actually desires a beating. So that he would be beaten, and people didn't even know him. They would insult him, even those who did not know him. <clears throat> so he went to a, a priest, and the priest advised him that he needed actually to, to change his internal thoughts, his, his attitude. So he did that. So the next time he moved around, everybody now was smiling at him, welcoming him. So everything changed. And I think from that context, it means that even for us, if we wanted to change things at Umu for the better, things in our workplaces, everywhere. So attitude is the key. Secondly, uh, there was something talked about the master life skills. I think there are so many topics mentioned there. But I picked one, uh, which is time management. Now, again, at one time we were attending a retreat as members of management. And someone mentioned uh, an experience of Nokia. I think you know what Nokia is? Yes, so I think it's a company somewhere in, in Japan. They are in the business of making uh, phones, I think. Yes, so, and things were not going right. The, the businesses were not really adding up. The businesses were poor. So management and the people met and ask themselves, what do we need to do? So they agreed that we can improve on how we manage time. And surprisingly, when every employee started doing that, business grew. Many people making orders increased. People asking questions about the company increased. 
And the rest is the history because we know that Nokia even up to here, some of us may be having phones from Nokia, but everything started from time management. Because that means that the, the customers are being addressed in time. The, the needs of the clients are being addressed in record time. So it changed everything. So that one touched me because also it came uh, through the keynote ad uh, speaker's address. And lastly, uh, the other one which touched me is the innovation and creativity. Um, again, I'm borrowing it from somewhere where I was attending. I think again, it was a retreat for management members. You know, every year we do have retreats. I'm not sure if this year we have had, we haven't had this year. <clears throat> but normally every year uh, we do get retreats. And someone was speaking to us, and the example was in regard to lack of creativity, lack of innovation. So here was a group of people working for a company, and they had a practice of every day before they begin their work to, to pray. Now, Every time they opened their prayers, they would look at a particular corner in the room, all of them. Even those who have come new in the company without knowing exactly what they were doing, but they, they would look at a particular corner. So one time, a new employee joined them and asked, but why, when we are reciting these prayers, why do we look there and there is nothing there? Many of those employees did not know. But they were doing things because they are always being done. Until they looked for an old person who had worked in the same company, who knew the story. And the story was that before the wall was painted, that is where the prayer was. So they would be reading the words from the wall. So even after the wall was painted, so people continued looking at the wall without, you know, finding other ways, you know, getting the prayer in their hearts and so forth. Now, that story in itself also shows that people had not moved. Things had changed, circumstances had changed, the wall had been painted, but they were still stuck, the wall. And I think even in our workplace sometimes, <coughs> we can get stuck in the same place without moving forward. You know, maybe we are expected to implement ideas of this time and we are still stuck in the past. And of course, business is not waiting for us. We remain behind. Um, from the keynote speaker's last words towards the end there, I think he mentioned that we need to multiply whatever we receive. I think that is a very uh, good advice. So I'd like to thank you once again, uh, Mr. Chichi, for giving us these wonderful ideas. I believe our graduates will benefit greatly, especially as they go out there, uh, either seeking for jobs or creating jobs uh, themselves. I would like to now answer two questions that have come from the audience. And I think all of them came from the online audience. The first question is that for the case of undergraduate jobs in UMU, jobs are given to those who are known by staff of UMU. There is no business in giving jobs in UMU. There is no fairness, sorry. There is no fairness in giving jobs in Umu. Now, what of us who have no connections in Umu, uh, how can we get such jobs? Uh, first of all, I would like to say that it is not true uh, that uh, there is unfairness in giving jobs. Our jobs are always advertised. Uh, people sit for interviews and then they are selected. But secondly, 
I would also like to pick from uh, Mr. Chichi's presentation. He talked about the networking. Many students, when they join the university, and we always speak about this in the orientation, they only know their class, where they go, their lecture rooms. They don't know where registered building is. They don't know where other you know, people who are working in the university are. They leave the university without knowing even anybody. So now you can imagine if an opportunity arises and the people are doing the interview, they don't know the student. Now how can they give you the job? And worse still, even in terms of, uh, in terms of answering the questions, one may not measure up. So they may not give you the job simply because they have to know you, but also how you present yourself, as we have been hearing in today's lecture. So this question again is emphasizing that you need even to network when you are still in the university. You begin from where you are, we have been told. So begin with the lecturers, begin with the staff, begin with the administration, and you are known. So I think that one is, is enough for that. Uh, the second one is, is in regard to public health. The question is that why is a woman not recognized by Allied Health Professional Council in awarding uh, public health degree? What is missing and what is our stake about this? Uh, to begin with, the course that is being offered at Uganda Matters University, it is accredited by the National Council for Higher Education. And in order for it to be accredited, the, the Allied Professional Council is also involved. So our course is recognized. So that's what I wanted to clear first. Now, what is still to be worked on is the, the question of being gazetted so that our students can be recognized by government to offer them jobs. Up to this moment, I think for many universities which are offering public, public health, I think they, I don't remember the, the department within government that gives jobs. They were looking at something related to environment and not public health. And so we were required that in order for our students um, to be recognized, or rather the course to be, of public health to be recognized, then we needed to be certified by the Allied Health Professional Council. I think this last year, we did apply uh, to this body and they responded. Uh, they gave us a chance, they came and looked at our buildings, they looked at our courses, uh, they looked at everything that we, we, we had. And after that visit, they made a, a number of recommendations. Now, one of those recommendations had to do with the lab skill, the skills lab. I think that's the best ex explanation. The skills lab, which we did not have. Now, as I speak, we are uh, still preparing that skills lab. Once it is completed, then these people, we shall invite them back. And from the look of things, how they were talking to us, um, it's not really a big issue, as some people would like to give it here. So once they come, and then they go, give us a go ahead, so the course now will be gazetted. It will be put in the papers. And, uh, and after that, I think there will be no problem. Once again, the Madam MC, uh, I was asked to, to give the closing remarks, which I have done, and to give a vote of thanks. I'd like to repeat once more uh, to thank Mr. Chichi for giving us time and also for giving us ideas, and also for Professor Wanyama uh, for being a good discussant, and the audience, because uh, the people who are giving these speeches it would be meaningless if there was no audience and for that matter an active audience so i would like also to thank you and particularly uh, our graduates so thanks so much
very much, our dear registrar, and thank you, everyone. Would like to thank you, our people online, our graduates, uh, the staff members, and like to thank all the people right here in the house. Uh, beginning with the vice chancellor, we are very grateful for gracing this ninth commencement lecture. Our guest speaker today, the discussant, the member of uh, management, members of management, all the staff members present here, we are very grateful. We are going to have lunch after here, which is served right uh, after here in the, in the boardroom. And we are going to have a photograph, which is going to be in front of the administrative block, um, just near the, the reception right now. So let's have a closing prayer from Brother Alogias, and I request you to stand up. So after the closing prayer, we get out for the photograph, and then that will continue with lunch. Thank you very much. Let us humble ourselves this prayer. Father, absorb and digest what we have received and see how we can put it into application. <coughs> Our prayer will be in the form of this note. But we remember our brothers and sisters. Give me joy in my heart, give me praise. Give me joy in my heart, I praise. Hallelujah. Give me joy in my heart, give me praise. <coughs> give me praise in Hello, hello members. After the photograph, uh, those with uh, academic gowns, you go to the, uh, the office of the vice chancellor so that we can take off the gowns and 
then have food later. Thank you very much. Uganda Matters University Council and Senate with pleasure invite parents and students to the 26th virtual graduation ceremony which will be held on Friday 21st of May at the main campus in Nkosi under the theme like the Uganda Matters the Lord will stand by me and give me strength the graduation ceremony will be aired live on BBS TV starting at 9 a.m. and on all university social media platforms the guest of honor will be Mr. Gideon Badagawa the executive director Private Sector Foundation Uganda. For more information, visit the university website on www.unu.ac.ug or call 0382-410-611 or 0772-461-386 and 0782-924-509. Uganda Matters University, making a difference.